times this reading today from the Holy Gospel of St. Luke, where Christ performs two miracles almost within a few minutes of each, each one. The first one of a woman who had a flow of blood and for 12 years was suffering from this, could not be cured by anybody, spent all her goods on this, her money and her wealth and her energy, basically driven almost to despair. And she came up whilst the Christ was amongst the crowd, touched his garment and was immediately made well. Immediately. She knew that she was immediately made well. Our Lord Jesus Christ, of course, knowing that it was her that touched her, but nevertheless wanted this woman to confess this to him, said that he had felt somebody touch him and power come from him, and he wanted to know who it was. Not so much for himself, because he knew, but in order that it be witnessed to the crowd that was there, his apostles and the others. And knowing that she could not escape, no, she admitted that this was her, and that indeed she was cured at that moment. Right then, a servant came from the synagogue and said to the father of a girl who was sick that her daughter had died, his daughter had died, and that he should no longer be asking Christ to come into the house to see her. We sort of have this incident as a witness that indeed this girl did die, so that nobody could later on say that oh, she was in some sort of coma or she fell asleep or something like that. If it was purely apparent, you know how parents tend to exaggerate about their children, you could have um, accused them of this. But in this case it was a servant who came to the father who was with Christ and said, don't ask the teacher, that is Christ, to come because your daughter has died. Our Lord Jesus Christ, of course, not being um, of that mould that they considered him, said that they should have faith and come and see the girl. He put everybody out of the house except the mother and the father and three of, three of his disciples. Asked the girl to arise, and she did, resurrected there on the spot. And to prove that she was indeed the resurrected girl and not some sort of spirit or um, manifestation, he ordered that she be given to eat, something to eat. Everybody was amazed and he gave orders to tell no one that took place. These are two miracles that we have here in the Gospel of St. Luke of Christ not only curing a very... <coughs> Um, awful sickness, but raising another person from the dead, as he's able to do being God. And again, we hardly ever hear about these things in modern times, um, about the miracles of Christ. And we don't hear about it because there is, as I say to you almost every week, there is a decided effort to try and eliminate the whole idea of Christianity from the world. This week in particular, we had terrible things happening some of you would be aware of it. A royal commission has been established to look into the mystery of confession. This is like a, a first step into the attack upon the sacraments of the church. Those things which that make the church the church. It's not a new thing in the world overall because we suffered through that through the communist era where all those sorts of things were banned, were controlled, were manipulated in various ways. And here we now have the first step in the West where this is going to be put into action. Those who understand how these commissions work will tell you that it's going to take about 10 years, which means they're going to look in very closely into all the aspects of church. Maybe not so much the Orthodox Church as such, but certainly the Orthodox Church won't escape the decisions that are going to be made there because it's going to um, affect all churches. What's the cause of all of this? Well, it's not what they say, but the whole cause of it occurred after the schism, after 1056, when the 
heretics who cut themselves away from the church, the Roman Catholics, decided that it would be a good idea that their priests be never married. An unusual thing because they profess to be the carriers of St. Peter, to be actually almost like an incarnation of St. Peter, who was a married person. So it doesn't sort of make sense. Having done this, they unleashed upon the world a toy for the devil to play with, unmarried priests. The evil spirits don't have to do very much to um, send a person like that into all sorts of trouble. It's a very unnatural state. Yes, there are some people that can be clergy, monastics or something and not marry, but it's not for everybody. In fact, it's only for a small minority. But nevertheless, those who wanted to be <coughs> of some sort of priestly rank in the Roman confession were not allowed to get married. Burning with passions and all the other sorts of things, of course, it's going to lead to trouble. And now we have the fruit of this coming into the West, which is going to destroy them and have a repercussion upon the Orthodox Church as well. You know, people think that this confession is some sort of joke today. They don't know how it's done in orthodoxy, but they see it in the Roman parts, where somebody goes into a cabinet and talks to the wall, while somebody on the other side of a cabinet listens, and then, I don't know what they do after that, say something or whatever. <clears throat> I'll read to you what, in orthodox Christianity, the priest reads a confession so that all of you understand and all of you know what these words are. The words that are read to you, you may not hear fully, but nevertheless, let me read them to you so that you understand what sort of things the church is giving to those who come to confession. It begins like this. Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> let us pray to the Lord. O Lord God of our salvation and of thy servants, who art merciful, compassionate, and long-suffering, who repentest thee concerning our evil deeds, desires not the death of a sinner, but that he or she should turn from his or her wickedness and live. In other words, our Lord Jesus Christ repentest about the fact that we are in a sinful state. He doesn't like that and he's going to do something about that. Do thou thyself be merciful unto thy handmaiden or thy servant and grant unto him or her an image of repentance, pardon and remission of sins. So the priest is begging Christ to give that repentance, pardon, remission of sins. Forgive him or her every transgression, voluntary or involuntary, and then follows probably the most important part. Reconcile and unite him or her unto the Holy Church. These are really startling words. Reconcile and unite him or her unto the Holy Church. In other words, the person that has fallen away through a sinful life has fallen away from the Church and needs to be reconciled. Otherwise, they cannot receive Holy Communion or the other mysteries that occur. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom is due unto thee dominion and majesty, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. That is a very different thing to the sort of words that you hear about confession, where anybody can come and say something to the wall and then be saying, okay, you're absolved, go and, um, you know, whatever they say about their penance that they give. <clears throat> Here we are trying to reconcile a person who has fallen away and wants to change their life to become one that is pleasing to Christ. It's a mystery, and it can't be torn apart or looked into as people of the world think. In the USSR, they put KGB agents to be priests so that they could extract from the people different information in order to persecute them, kill them, send them to prison, etc. 
That's the sort of thing that's going to happen now here. Ten years is a long time, and during that, that period, a lot of things are going to be brought forth. And as I say to you, even though the Orthodox Church itself may not be looked into specifically, it won't escape the laws that are going to come out of that. Are they going to ban confession? Are they going to ban these mysteries? Are they going to water them down again and again? What are they going to make of them? What are they going to do? If this isn't a blatant persecution to the church, then I don't know what it is. And this all stems from the fact that in 1056 they cut themselves away and now, lo and behold, we have Orthodox bishops who want to unite with that, who want to have, follow that way, that same way that has caused this problem throughout the world. You wonder, where are we all heading on account of all this? If our own leaders are <clears throat> eagerly waiting almost salivating to become big and famous like those in the Roman Confession are. For what? For power? For glory? For what? <clears throat> they claim to be Christ representative on earth. Christ who was born in a cave, who never had a decent set of clothes, had no place to lay his head. Either walk, rode a donkey, never had a chauffeur or anything like this, and was crucified in the end, who never had a mitre but a crown of thorns. And they all profess to be representatives of Christ. I can't see the, the likeness there at all, not in the least bit. And the same with all these other things. <clears throat> the mystery of confession is a mystery. It's when a person comes to try and reconcile themselves to the church, to be part of the church so that they can have life everlasting and change their life for whatever deeds they did do wrong and change them in such a way that they don't do those things again. And as I said to you, there is a difference between the initial understanding of these things. Those in the West believe that they are holy, and that when they commit a sin, they go and confess it and then they're holy again. In the Orthodox Church, we believe that we are not holy, that we are born in a fallen state, and that through our lifetime that's given to us, we are supposed to get ourselves out of that through our Christian life and through the power that Christ, Christ has given us. So we are not holy. Committing a sin doesn't lower you any further than what you really are. It hinders you in your progress in a spiritual life. And that's what you want to overcome. And that's what the big difference is. That's why we don't come and go through all the sins one by one that we've committed during the week or something like that. As if these are mistakes in our life and once I correct them I'll be holy again. That's not the point. We want to know what is your attitude to the spiritual life. Can you see what is happening inside you and how wretched this fall is in us that's stopping us from getting close to the kingdom of heaven. Can you see that in yourself? Because that is progress. And if you, if you can, then you can be doing something about it and through Christ's grace, God's grace, you can be put out of that and indeed become Christ-like then. You are not Christ-like now like they believe. And that has never been the case. It will be interesting and maybe very frightening to see over the next 10 years what's going to develop in this. But I can tell you now it's going to be a bigger and bigger push to destroy Christianity. And given that in orthodoxy we already have our leaders waiting to be part of the great universal ecumenical church or whatever they want to call themselves, it's a lamentable things. And we are only going to be thrust more and more into the catacombs as occurred in um, the Soviet countries during the 20th century. May God help us in this struggle that's coming to us and allow us to preserve ourselves in truth, even without all this worldly glory that surrounds them. Who needs that which is going to be taken away? But 
may we not lose our souls and follow that way that Christ has given us for 2,000 years which has worked for others. God bless and protect you all.